to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to a well-designed business. It's Power Talk Friday. You know, I think at this point, I'm doing this uh, this podcast long enough that I can tell you I've absolutely noticed similarities in the typical interior design business, right? And one of those similarities is that by and by, the largest majority of the owners of interior design businesses do not like doing the back end. <laughs> I mean, shocking revelation, right? Now, I will tell you, very, very few of you have ever walked up to me and said, I don't know what you talk about on that darn podcast all the time because I love doing the back end. I love processing systems, right? No. But the thing is, there are unicorns among us. There are. There there are those of you that do like it. And we're lucky because today I have one of those very rare unicorns. Kate Saunders is with us today. And Kate knows a lot about organization, process, systems, and streamlining into your design businesses so that you can improve your efficiency and profitability. And today she is with us to share her insights, particularly the things that she knows are the major areas where we trip up, right? And so I think you're going to like this show. Before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to thank our show sponsor, Revel Woods. Revel Woods is your source for premium hardwood and resilient flooring. Using the Revel Woods selector tool, you are able to find curated suggestions for your projects that are going to hit all the bells and whistles. Investment range, look and style, the type of flooring or subflooring it's installed on, the part of the country, the humidity, the, you know, atmosphere conditions that you are going to be dealing with, because all of these things go into the success of a hardwood flooring project. So I highly encourage you to sign up for a free professional membership at revelwoods.com to learn more and to get started. Now, I also want to share with you that Revel Woods will be with us in High Point. So if you're listening to the show in real time, High Point Market is starting next week. And John Dupre and Aubrey will be there from Revel Woods. So they're sponsoring the Power Talk Friday Tour, which is my one-day, all-day coaching event that's happening on Friday, October 21st. And then they are also co-sponsoring a panel discussion on Saturday morning, 11 a.m. So this is Saturday, October 22nd, 2022 at 11 a.m. at Jaipur, okay? And what we are going to do is we're going to have a panel discussion there, and we're going to talk about how to lead your business through any type of market condition. And so that's the highs and the lows that we face as business owners in economy, in the economy, right? And so I have a killer panel. First of all, we got the Vincennes. The Vincennes is coming to High Point. Yes, he is. He usually comes to High Point. He is always part of the Power Talk Friday day and does sit down and coach with you one-on-one in the small group setting. But this is the first time that I am putting him on a panel. And I, you know what? How could I not? 50 years in business, 40 years at Window Works, 10 years of running um, in, uh, health clubs. And um, man, The guy has seen a thing or two about leading your company through various economic conditions. And so I just, there was no way 
He's going to be there. I was like, you have to be on this panel. You got to help all of us. And then, of course, I'm going to have uh, Nicole Heimer from Glory and Brand is going to be there. And she's going to talk about how to navigate it from a marketing perspective. We've got Claire Jefford who's going to be with us. And she's going to be talking about it from uh, how to handle it from a client experience perspective. Like so managing your teaching you and helping you and giving you insights on how to up your client experience game so that you can survive through any fluctuation. And then finally, I'm going to have Rashida Gray with us. So Rashida and I have been talking a couple of markets. I'm trying to get her on a panel that works and fits and who, what, the, what happened and what didn't happen. And I'm very excited because uh, Rashida has a strong business background. She's come out of the gate. I think her firm might be five years old at this point. I'm not even sure. And I've literally watched her from almost the beginning, about eight or nine months in business. And I have always admired how she intentionally runs her business. And, you know, I know from my personal conversations with her that it's the real thing. And that's important to me because I want you to be able to have that voice in this group of experts. I want you to have that voice of the person who's with boots on the ground doing it just like you're doing it. Of course, Claire is also a designer, boots on the ground. Um, but she does have her coaching and the other things. And Rashida is running a very, very fine, strong business, profitable business. And I think that she's going to add a tremendous perspective to this. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I hope you will join us. I'm sure there is an RSVP for it in my link tree and in Instagram. If you're on my email list, I do believe we sent it around. Would love to see you. And then also on Sunday is my birthday party. <laughs> so um, look, all of this is in the link tree. So right now, let's get to Kate Sanders. How about that? Hi, Kate. Thanks so much for joining me on a well-designed business today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I'm very intrigued, Kate. It looks like from the little bit of research I've done on you that you are a seasoned interior designer who is making a pivot in their business. And this pivot, you know, called the Design Co Designers Collab is a company that knowingly, wantingly, joyfully asks to do the back-end operations of an interior design firm. Is this correct? That is correct. Yeah, I um, love doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like two out of 100 designers and we found one. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I spend all day, every day talking to to designers who, you know, can't stand the back end. It's like, ah, I don't want to do the back end. Not that I've not met any designers that love the puzzle of the back end operations and enjoy making it efficient and making it work. But uh, I guess yeah. you also have found that most of your colleagues, that's not really their superpower and what they enjoy doing, right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, more of the techie stuff that I actually enjoy doing that you know, as a creative, um, may not be their strong suit. So, so, so how does this happen? How did it happen? Was it, uh, did you spend a period of time, like many designers working for other firms and, you know, like, you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm, it, this is reminding me and I'm curious if your trajectory mirrors the e-myth. So have you ever read the book, the e-myth by Michael Gerber, Kate? I have not. Oh, you would love it. You would love this yeah. book. Okay. So in the E-Myth, it's this like, you know, it's, it's a, a fantastic business book. Highly recommend it. But basically, the premise of it is that there are um, the entrepreneurs, the managers, and the technicians. And the world is filled with all three. But what happens is people who are technicians, so an interior designer that is working for someone else um, mm -hmm. is typically what you would call a technician. And that means that they are doing the actual work that, that is the product that is delivered to the consumer, right? So you know, you're, you're an oil painter, you're a, you know, a graphic artist, you're an interior designer, you're doing the work. And in the book, he has this little uh, story where he talks about how this one um, woman was working as a baker at her grandmother, her aunt's place or whatever, and making all the pies and doing all the things and coming up with the recipes and all the stuff. And then finally decides, you know, 
hey, I'm the one doing all the work here. And I'm the one that's doing all the creativity. And, you know, my granny over there is, you know, what is she doing? <laughs> I don't know. They, right. they, they, they didn't exactly present it this way. But, you know, the point is, is that she decides to go out on her own and, you know, Annie's Bakery or whatever. And the next thing you know, you know, she's got to do the marketing and she's got to line up and get the supplies ordered. And she's got to, you know, find people to sell it to. And she's got to, you know, get packaging and all the things. And little by little, Annie isn't doing the baking anymore. Annie is doing the work of the entrepreneur and the manager. And so, yeah. you know, right. And so I, am I visualizing that here you are, you're working in firms, you're loving, you know, what you're tasked with doing, the work, the actual back work, go out on your own, far, start a firm and then find out, huh, I'm not doing that anymore. And then you turn around and go, but that's the part I like to do. So let me make a business out of that. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of both. Mm. Um, so I do love the interior design process and working directly with the clients. I still very much like that. And that's why um, I still do the design projects. But I also, half of me still loves doing the back end work of creating, you know, um, all the content that's needed for that project, such as the presentations or the CAD drawings, the renderings, and all those things. So I don't know, I, I don't know much about being my horoscope, but I'm a Libra. So I, I like to balance, mm. um, you know, I, I, there's two sides of me um, and I've just been fighting for the last 20 years, what side I love more. <laughs> and I really love, you know, helping designers and working with designers directly um, and kind of learning more about their business and what they do and their goals and helping them reach their goals. So um, you know, I do love both. And that's why um, I kept my design business open as well. Interesting, right? And yeah. so when you think about the back end operations about like you said, I love the way you phrase that creating all the content for a project, right? Whether yeah. it's a proposal, an actual mood board, it's a, a spec drawing, you know, whatever a schedule of, you know, deliverables, right? That's all goes into creating. That is the content of a project. Mm -hmm. So when you think about doing that, you know, what do you find are the, like, is there a, one or two or a few mistakes that stand out in your mind that over your 20 year career, either you previously made yourself that, you know, made the project not as um, efficient or you see as tendencies in designers that don't like to do the back end. So the red flags when we're creating mm -hmm. content for projects, anything come to mind, Kate? Um, a big one is just kind of um, file management. Um, to be honest, um, mm. there's, you know, when you're creating um, all these different pieces of content or parts of your project, having a system for keeping those organized and, you know, the, all the revisions that are included as you're working on those projects. Um, I found that some designers aren't necessarily ag as good at keeping those organized. And so, going back to older drawings or going back to something that they, you know, thought they fixed, but they didn't save it correctly, um, actually kind of takes up a lot of time. Mm. Um, and that's where a lot of mistakes are made because, you know, say you thought you, um, made a correction on presentation, you go, you go back to save it, then you go present to your client and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm missing a page out of my presentation. <laughs> that makes you look bad. Um, and you know, there's ways to have avoided that if you kind of are more organized on the back end and able to keep everything in line. Um, I'm very much a, a streamlined person. I have my systems in place and in, in regards to how I save things. So I know exactly. And with a hundred percent certainty, what I'm working on is the latest and greatest. Oh, so I can actually, you know, I can easily visualize how important that would be. I mean, my original business for 40 years is interior window treatments. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can tell you, Kate, like, uh, listen, the, any longtime listeners here know that I have, you know, complained <laughs> yeah. about the inefficiency in the process with some design firms because exactly that it's you know the the changes are asked for by email they're given to you and the number of times that 
we have revisions to the window treatment quote that has been agreed. Mm -hmm. You know, we send it and the designer's like, yay, love it. That's good. This is what we're going to go with. Then you get their purchase order and it's a, it's a copy of the, the, of the information before the revisions. And, right. you know, me as the person on the end that's now got to put this into production for you, I'm thinking, well, are we going back to the original or is this a mistake or what's uh-huh. happening? Right. And so yeah. and, and listen, I complain about it because it makes me crazy because now I got to do all the homework to figure out, like, are you going back? Blah, blah, blah. But I actually understand and have compassion. There's a thousand details oh, sure. on a design project. Right. So I make yeah. a joke and complain. But, you know, in reality, we always do do all that extra work and tracking the down and asking the questions because it is it is easy to happen. So when you yeah. say file management, love it. When you say that you have a hundred percent foolproof system, what do you do? How, what is that? Is that system involved or is it two or three tips that you could share with us to help your colleagues be better? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few different ways to do that. Um, you know, you kind of touched upon it with the emails, right? So emails are just one of the hardest things I think um, as them. an interior designer <laughs> to keep control of. Mm-hmm. There's just so many that you're dealing with from all sorts of different subs and, um, you know, contractors that you're working with. And so, um, you know, when you're utilizing any kind of emails you know, service, you know, Outlook, for instance, having a really good way of organizing all those emails that are coming in and having kind of a, a, a task um, system for them and a flagging system for them really helps to um, keep the latest information um, kind of at the top. Um, so that's one way that, you know, I really help with that is just making sure that, you know, we're flagging things correctly and we're putting them in kind of a, a, a way a flagging system to know I need to respond to this now. This is what has happened. And then creating your folders and subfolders to kind of keep it all organized that way. Hmm. Um, keeping your file system on your computer or shared, um, you know, we use OneDrive in our system. We also have Outlook, but um, ways to be able to organize your files Um, you know, I have incoming, um, I have outgoing, I have all these different folders and subfolders where it helps me to keep it all organized in terms of when something came in and when I sent something out. So I can always go back and refer to that. So that's another, um, way to kind of help with that. So, so let me understand that. So for instance, you know, a designer, requests a quote from a particular vendor and that vendor here is your window treatment quote for the project and it's you know September 1st or whatever and that mm-hmm. goes into your incoming folder mm-hmm. and then what happens if you're if you then say I want changes we decided to do Roman shades instead of draperies now how how do you keep track of when to your point when it's time to invoice your client or it's time to present to your client i should say that you're not coming to the mm-hmm. meeting with the the older quote as opposed to the newer quote yeah so yeah we have say for example we have our incoming folder and mm-hmm. In that inside that folder, we would also have subfolders from different vendors that we're working with. Um, say it was a window treatment um, vendor that we were working with, then we would have that as a subfolder, um, and then we'll we would keep all the files within that subfolder at, dated. Oh. So we know, you know, we'll say um, window quote dated nine twenty twenty two. So that on 9 20, 21, when we go to present it to our client, we know that was the latest and greatest um, right. quote. Um, so we just make sure we date everything and um, kind of keep it simple that way. If we're working on a presentation, for example, um, we'll have one pre- one folder, um, say it's presentation um, to client X or whatever. Um, we'll keep a live file of that presentation say it's in um, Photoshop or whatever it is, we'll keep a live file in that presentation folder, but then archive any older, um, you know, Mm. presentations that we've been working with. And we make sure we always keep an archive again with the date um, of that presentation within the archive. So we can always have something a reference back, but then, um, so that's just kind of an example of how we organize it. 
You know, this is really good because I have to say, for someone like yourself, it probably seems very ABC basic. Right. But I, I, I'm already like, this is like, it, you know, this one is it's, it's something that is seems obvious, but it isn't to somebody whose brain dead doesn't click this way. Yeah. Just that simple thing of archiving. Archive the quote that's not relevant like don't throw it away don't right. <laughs> delete it but wow. archive it and now when you pull okay so love that tip and then the other thing in there that I was curious is is that are you having the ingoing and the outgoing with the subfolders per client now not you running the designers collab with uh -huh. you know designers hiring you but as a right. working interior designer does the smith family and the jones family have their own ingoing and outgoing or is it ingoing outgoing and all window treatment ingoing is there for all projects no i would definitely keep it separated by clients okay good so that's what i was thinking the way that yeah the way that we name it would be you know most most designers have a project number and mm -hmm. then the project name. So we would keep it, you know, listed with the project number and then project name so that in the file itself, I would see all that um, just easily listed. And then within that client folder, I would have all my subfolders that, such as incoming or outgoing. Okay, that that makes sense. And if you had said the other, I would have been like, whoa, I don't think I yeah. can manage that. <laughs> no, that would be um, much more difficult. And then I, I also mirror the um, file management in my computer to kind of similar to what's um, managed in my Outlook as well. I keep okay. it consistent that way. That makes sense. And then how about what I find is one of the nitty gritty details that gets overlooked often is and I'm sure it's not unique to designers with specifying and getting their window treatments quoted. It's probably the same for tile and paint schedules mm -hmm. and all the things. But a typical thing is we're going to give a quote prior to all fabrics being selected. The w windows are ready to measure. You know, Kim goes out. She takes all the measurements. You've got either you've decided that these are the fabrics, uh, and then we quote specifically based on those fabrics, or you haven't decided. Maybe you're like, well, in these two rooms, we don't have the fabrics picked, but these two rooms we do. Either way, we quote you. And if it's like based on 54 inch, zero repeat, fabric to be decided, fine. Mm -hmm. Or it's, you know, Sally met Harry fabric color blue. Here's your yardage. What I find happens has, and all the years when I was doing the work directly myself is that whole project progresses. I'm sure. not selling the fabric to the designer in, I would say eight out of 10 cases. So ultimately the designer and I, our money isn't going to change based on the fabric selection either being specified ultimately or changed. But here's what happens. We'll actually get to the PO and it'll say things like TBD or it'll say uh -huh. fabric Sally met Sally color blue. But then here's what happens is and for living room. And then two weeks later, I get fabric for Mark, that designer living room. And it's, you know, I don't know, Joe boy color green. Like, it's like, yeah. wait, is this the wrong fabric? So that's a little nudge. It's a tiny detail in the myriad of details that a designer's got on their plate, but that is often overlooked. What, what is your catch yeah. for that? Um, so again, I just, you're going to say it's discipline, to, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just, um, I think the hardest thing for designers is, you know, we're working on so many different yeah. projects at one time. And mm -hmm. my gosh, I don't know how to keep this fabric together from for this client A with client, you know, D's fabric. It's mm -hmm. it's a lot of it's a lot of pieces and it's a lot to keep managed and organized. So, you know, I'm a big note taker huge note taker. I mm -hmm. can't ever work on a project without having proper notes. And so um, a big part of that is, you know, there's online and web-based um, note systems that you can use. And I notate everything. Um, I date everything with it. And um, I'll keep tabs on, you know, the progression of, you know, that design project and all the changes that have occurred. Um, and that's really, and I, you know, weekly meetings with your team to understand 
what has changed or whatnot helps with that. But I definitely am a big note taker um, and I make sure to date every single change basically um, that has happened um, so that I can go back to it. And, and with changes like what you're saying, um, again, I just date it um, in my um, file system um, with, you know, quote A having been um, blue fabric and then quote B or purchase order having been blue fabric, I'll make sure to um, just save those different quotes and then date them so that I know again, mm -hmm. this was what ha happened and what, what is the latest. And so, so that makes perfect sense, right? But where it gets dropped is, you know, you capture the notes, but you don't actually change the documentation. It, and so yeah. what, so what happens there? Is that literally Kate, look, before you send a purchase order out, if you, you just, there's no other answer, but you have to read it with intent and really pay attention. Or, you know, is, is there a step before that where on a weekly basis or whatever, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know because I can imagine how onerous it is. You know, like I said, it's not just fabric selections. It's, you know, hardware selections. It's drapery. It's mm -hmm. like, like tile selections. It's paint like It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. But I know that this yeah. is an Achilles heel. And if you have some magic bullet, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, the only thing that, you know, helps me really keep track of it is, is kind of threefold or twofold, I guess. Um, you know, when a change needs to be made, I document it, like I, I mentioned with my notes, but then I make sure to change it immediately on all avenues of mm. whatever that's affecting. Right. So if it's a presentation, so usually, you know, I'll have a presentation I'm working on. Um, and it's kind of an ongoing presentation, even if I've already presented it to the client, mm -hmm. um, I'll still keep that presentation open. And as I'm making changes, I kind of, I'll update that presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll update my spec book. So usually when a change is being made, I just make sure as soon as it's being made or it's happened, I go back and I update all the other portions that are being affected with it so that it's consistent all the way across. And that's really kind of the only way that in my mind I can kind of catch any drop um, within that process. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that makes sense. I, I mean, look, yeah. it, 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 to a certain extent, there is no magic bullet, right? No, and there yeah. is just doing it. But mm -hmm. I think even that message right there, it's if I am making a change, I, I, you know, consider all the places this information is showing up and you take the time to make the change in all the places. Yeah. Right. And so that, that does make sense because the internal documents that a design firm carries are not the only places that the change is happening. The change is happening on the presentation board. The change is happening on the quotes going, you know, the revisions and requests going out to the vendors yeah. and stuff. So, and then ultimately the POs going to the vendors. And so it is, just maybe it's as simple as having a list next to you where all all information is kept and you know when you make a change like what of the 10 places where information shows up would this be relevant right and yeah I've cr I've created spreadsheets I'm a big spreadsheet person <laughs> <laughs> which also kind of fights my other um, creative side but I love <laughs> I love a good spreadsheet um, and so I do have and depending on the scope of the project and, and how complex it really is, I will have a much more detailed spreadsheet that will reference all of these other documents um, and, you know, I'll tailor it to the project that I'm working on. And so kind of to what you were saying, you know, I'll have due dates for things and I'll have check boxes for certain um parts or components of that project that need to get done, say quote to a PO um, and any revisions in between. And I'll check box whether or not um, those revisions have been caught and changed and, and you know, cross-reference them with the other aspects. So that's kind of how I keep it all organized and understand um, to make sure and, and also to remind me um, that 
I need to make these changes in other um, components as well. Because if I'm making a change on a quote, um, and now that is its latest quote, but I forgot to do it on a presentation and I go mm -hmm. back later, I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Yes, my which one is right? <laughs> which one is right now? I can't remember because, oh my gosh, you're working on so many things, you're not going to be able to remember all that. Right, right, right. That's that, yeah, I can imagine that feeling. Yeah. So, one of the other things, and I, I, I don't know that I've ever talked with an interior designer about this before, but I know it happens in my business, um, you know, running the podcast and all of that part of my business is, is naming conventions. And so mm -hmm. are there, is that a big thing in interior design as well when you're operating the back end? Like, you know, sometimes we'll call Luann Live in the drive, you know, a document will spell out Lou Ann Live. And then other times it's L-N-L. -L. And then it's like, you know, and then all of a sudden you're like, where is the welcome document? Because I've searched the drive and I can't find it. And yeah. it started in the beginning when, you know, I was doing a lot of this myself and had no clue. And then over the years, as more, you know, highly frontal lobe developed individuals have started working for me, they're like, yeah. you know, this is a mess back here. We got to start calling everything the same. Is yes. that also a factor in how you set up your back end operations? hundred percent. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's, it's really, really important to have um, a naming convention that will work for you and your team and be consistent across the board. So um, typically, and I've worked with um, architecture firms and interior designers, and there is a slight difference between working with both. And a lot of architecture firms have a very specific naming, naming convention and they were very strict on it. And so when they start a project, they will um, automatically have a templated folder system mm. um, where they'll just copy it and then rename it. Mm. So everything within that folder system is copied over. So all the subfolders and it's consistent every single time for every single project. Um, and they have a very specific way that they'll name that project. So um, like I mentioned, I'll name the projects, that project number underscore the full project name. And if, if you're working with a client that has multiple locations, you know, they have two homes that you're working on, then it'll be that, pro that um, client name and then the location, if that needs to be. Mm -hmm. so, um, so then that way it's always consistent across the board. And then it makes it easier for your team to understand where to save things, how to save it, and how to name it. Um, because as you know, you're working, if you're a bit larger firm, you have multiple um, interns and junior designers, mm. um, job captains and all these that are working on the projects and working within the folders. So if there's, you know, it's a way to reduce the confusion as to, oh my gosh, where do I save this? Or how am I going to, how am I supposed to name it so that another designer can easily find it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because even like when you get into the sub quotes and so forth, one person, one job might say window treatments for Smith. And then the next job, it's like drapes and Romans for Jones. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> what am I doing here? Right. Yeah. So it, I think it's easy. It's easy enough to just, you kind of create a template in, um, in your desktop or, mm -hmm. um, you know, your shared drive. And then everyone knows that template is, is kind of how you work with it. So you have an example for all these different things and then you just copy it over so that, I love um, it. and you know, I'm big on creating, um, a, a book of standards for your company mm. as well. And I've, cr I've created many standards, um, you know, books of standards for different companies. Um, and I'll outline all these different steps and how to organize it, how the naming is, um, you know, standards and procedures. So, you know, it's funny, it the too. work that I've um, been able to do with the higher gross revenue firms, when you start to get into the three, four, five million dollar uh, revenue areas, mm -hmm. The two of one, they have the book of standards. Yeah. You know, you don't get to that level without creating this. And when I'm working with firms that are, you know, still scaling to their first half million, let alone their first million year in revenue and two million year in revenue, we often, I'm often saying, you know, do you have your 
you know, things enunciated. Like, I know that you know what you mark up tile. I know that you know how you do this, but you know, you're not always going to be just you, even if you have right. just one assistant, you know what I'm saying? And so it's so much easier uh, to build that as you're building your business. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 it's, I think it's really important. I don't think a lot of designers necessarily think it might be important up front. Um, but I'm continually working on it. You know, it's, it's yes. always a live <laughs> document that right. I go back and edit and say, you know what, that, that, that process didn't work and maybe we need to try this. Um, and I think it's really important to set it up in the beginning. Um, it takes a lot of time. It does. Um, I'll be honest to set up your, your standards and procedures takes time, but I think it's so important even especially if you're trying to grow your business mm -hmm. um, because it helps to keep your entire team in line and, and understanding of what, ha, what your vision is for your business mm -hmm. um, and understand, you know, you have so much knowledge and experience, you know, it all right in your head of how you want to run this business, but does your team, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily going to know it unless you outline it for them. Right. Right. And so um, I think it's really important. I, I agree 100 percent. And it's funny because we don't you know, we're not we're not often and many of us will never find ourselves in the situation where as a smaller business, one, two people that you have to be that you, you well, I'm going to say you you will probably find yourself at some period in life where you have to be out of your business for one, two, three, four, five days unexpected. Yeah. But we're not often in the position where we it requires us to have somebody else step in and keep things moving for that period of time. But I can tell you that I remember, oh my goodness, I don't think we were in business eight or 10 years. And uh, our showroom coordinator had an emergency, like a legit profound emergency within her family. And here mm -hmm. she is. She is the person that makes all the appointments. She's the person that makes the appointments for salespeople, installers, answers the phone. She's the hub of our business. And at that yeah. point, it was probably, I don't know, three quarters of a million dollar business, right? So it wasn't overly crazy. Um, but Vinny was working in Washington, D.C. at the time. He was vice president of franchise sales at Decorating Den. I've got a three-year-old, and it's me, and she had to be out. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I, I cannot do all the sales. I cannot schedule all the things. I cannot answer all the telephones, be a mom and do all the things. And, um, yeah. you know, my one girlfriend, she had office experience, was a capable, intelligent, you know, human person. And I said to her, can you just come in like four hours a day for the next two weeks while my showroom coordinator handles this personal situation? And, you know, because it's a highly systemized business, you know, is it the same? No. Oh, but she could step in. You know what I mean? There were things I'm like, here's where you'll find the answers to that. Here's where you find this here. And like, and there were no cell phones then. It wasn't call me out. I'm out on the road. It's like when I walked out of the building, I'm out, you know, yeah. but um, it's the difference between, you know, really knowing that, you know, in your head what you do, but having it on paper or, you know, digitally now, whatever it is, it enables all the things. It enables you to scale. It enables you to train. It enables you to go on vacation, but it also does help you in crisis too, because we're yeah. not getting out of this world without crisis touching us in some way, shape or form. Right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, and it also helps with training too. Yes. So right? when you're trying to hire on someone new, they're sitting there completely, you know, wide eyed, like, okay, how do I do this? You know, if you have a good training system in place too, um, it helps with that. So that in the, cause training someone in an interior design business is very hard because everyone is trying to do something. Mm -hmm. Everyone is busy working on something. So, um, it's really helpful to have that kind of standards and procedures slash training binder or booklet that they can sit down and kind of look through. And during, you know, um, kind of the busy time of, you know, trying to train someone, they can actually review and it's good to reference back. So it helps with the training aspect, too. Yes, 100 percent. We've been onboarding two new sales reps f at Window Works. I guess we're going in about 45 days now. And you know, it helps because 
it gives them, you know, you explain something, but then if it's also documented, whether it's written or a video, you know, at their own pace then, because I'll, you mm-hmm. know, I'll, I'll teach them something and I'll be like, and this is in the SOP book. So, you know, to this afternoon, we're going to talk about how to you do the fabric log. And I'm like, so go read the procedure. I'm going to come in. We're mm-hmm. going to talk about it. And then when we're done, I'm like, now sit down and read it again. And then I give them a new one yeah. to do on their own. So it's like this multiple levels of burning it on the brain cells, right? Yes. And and yeah. it also is helpful because some processes are more complicated and we don't have any expectation of somebody learning it with mastery with one or two, you know, training sessions on it. Sure. And so and 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 so what happens additionally, you know, your team is busy. So I'm, you know, p- bopping in, spending 15 minutes, a half hour here. Kim is bopping in. I'm I'm basically assigning others. You're going to spend an hour with them here. You're going to spend an hour with them there, blah blah blah. But yeah. the thing is, there's whole parts of days where I'm looking at everybody's calendar. I'm like, nobody's got time to spend with these people today. Yeah. Like this stinks. Yeah. And so yeah. then I will walk in and I'll be like, "Okay. So I want you to pull out the training videos the loom videos that we have you know sit here and watch these or read you know read the book on these sections because this is more difficult to comprehend and so blah 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 but there is there are all of those materials available in different ways where they can do quote unquote independent study right yes yeah yeah yeah, definitely it's um And people take information differently as well. So Mm. if you're verbally training someone, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big paper person. Mm -hmm. I like notes and I like to review them that way. Um, that's just how I retain knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, but some people, you know, are, are good at retaining knowledge verbally as well, but you know, you have a mix. So you Mm -hmm. have both parts of the training that can help be helpful for that person and they can take their time, um, in understanding all the different components of it. Yeah, no, it's funny too, because I am, I want you to explain it to me first in words, but then I, I'm very much, a, like, I will take all the notes I can while you're explaining it to me, mm-hmm. but then I do appreciate if it's written down. So it's yes. like, but my first is words. It's if yeah. you first hand me the manual, I'm just like, yeah, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yes. so, and as a matter of fact, I often will hand them the manual first when I'm training somebody, but I say to them. This may or may not make sense until we go through it verbally. However you mm-hmm. you work, however you process, it's fine. But, you know, you got an hour to spend until I'm going to sit here and spend the time with you. So you may as well read it, right? But I love, right. if, if I'm in that situation, I love knowing that the verbal's coming. Because, yeah. you know, I'm just like, it's an SAT problem until you start talking to me with your eyeballs and your mouth. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? yeah. So 16 people went this way and four went that way. How many got there? I don't know, right? <laughs> so... It helps to connect Uh, the dots for sure. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, so here's the thing. So, you know, you, 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 it's clear to me, this is our first time meeting. It's clear to me that you're highly organized, that you have proven systems and that now what you're doing is you are making it available to your colleagues through this new venture Mm -hmm. of yours called the designers collab. So just give us an overview of some of the, I mean, I looked at the website. It looks like other than actual purchasing you are pretty much, you know, able to take on almost 90% of a designer's back end. But go yeah. through a little bit some of the ways that, you know, give us your elevator pitch on the company so we can understand the deliverables. Yeah. So I'm, you know, the way that I look at it is I'm really kind of that extra hand that you need, right? So that extra person. So, um, like you mentioned, you know, I'm able to step in and really kind of provide services on, on the very beginning of a project all the way through installation. Um, there's, there's really a lot. What I try to have my clients focus on is provide, you know, giving me the task and things that are easily delegated and will, you know, are only billable task that will help to kind of with their profits. So I do, I do focus on the billable task and, mm. and that's such as like CAD drawings, renderings. Um, well, renderings sometimes can go in presentations. So depending on the, you know, business model, they may or may not charge all of that. But, um, you know, I really focus on what is easily delegated to me um, because we are virtual. I am not sitting next to you. Um, so there is going to be less back and forth in revisions. So, 
you know, CAD drawings are so easy to just hand over and delegate, um, creating a presentation, sourcing projects, um, things like that that are going to be billable to your client will help to kind of um, increase your profits and, and help you with that. But I am able to kind of step in through all of the process and I enjoy every single step of it. Um, I am based in Southern California. So a lot of my customer base is Southern California because I still am able to, even though we are virtual, I still am able to go out and do a site visit if needed. I can do site and field measurements, um, site verifications for the client because sometimes they're wrapped up in doing something and they're, you know, they're unable to go to a new project and do a full field verification. Mm. Um, so I'm able to go out and do that and, um, and, and bring that back to the, the office, draw it up, and, and there you go. You have your existing kind of um, shell of the building or um, home. Um, so yeah, we're, we're able to step in and, and really kind of, um, take off anything from their plate that they, um, just aren't able to, A, aren't as efficient, um, or experienced at, um, you know, there's a lot of really super talented creative designers, but they're not technically as savvy with CAD. And so it takes them a long time to draw up a plan. I've been working with CAD for almost 20 years um, and I love it and um, it's, it comes, it's very second nature to me. So I'm able to do it very fast. So that's a big part of it. Um, so something that you're not as proficient with um, something that you just don't have the time to do. Mm. Um, you know, those are really two things um, that a lot of designers will send over to us. Um, and you know, I, I'd love to do it all. I, I really honestly do. And, um, <laughs> <We're all> like, <laughs> um, you know, I, I like to sit in the office and I like to do the CAD and, you know, I'll, I'll pump my music and I'll just, and I'll just work on it, but I do still like to be out in the field as well. And so I, mm. I like to make that option available as part of my service too. So you'll see that on the website as listed there too, all the way through installation. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's comprehensive when you look at the website. It's scheduling yeah. and project coordination, day of install assistance if you want, the mm -hmm. on-site supervision and walkthroughs if you like. You said, email management, office support. You know, yeah. all the things are here. I mean, two two D digital presentations, three D renderings. Oh, there, it's all here. So, and we, you know, it the website is the designers collab dot com, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I have to say, you know, we need people like you that are happy as a little clam sitting there with their music on doing all of this <laughs> hard brain work for us. <laughs> so, yes, um, you. you know, I wish you a lot of luck in the endeavor. I'm sure that you'll probably get some designers reaching out to you, um, inquiring about your services. Thanks so much for coming on today, Kate, and telling us about all of this. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was a ton of fun and um, thank you again. You know that everything Kate said is right up my alley, right? It's no secret that A, I'm not inherently the most organized person when it comes to back end stuff. I've been known to fly by the seat of my pants and have a good time doing it too, I might add, if I'm truthful, right? But it did become very apparent to me early on in business that flying by the seat of our pants costs us both time and money. And that's when I became an admirer of process and system. I mean, let's be serious. That's when I became an evangelist for process and systems because I have learned, and I'm sure you've experienced, the little things add up. Searching for the emails, trying to locate documents, you know, because you didn't name them the same way, not knowing where you put things. These are little individually, but together they kill productivity and they're annoying as all get out, aren't they? So here's the thing, inefficiencies annoy the heck out of us, but they also cost us money. This is a no way Jose combination. <laughs> this is not a combination you can tolerate in your business, right? But systems and process can be intimidating. I get it. It's because it feels daunting to do a big, huge overhaul. So I'm urging you, think about a single area that's causing you problems. 
Think about what is at the heart of why it is causing a problem. Fix it and move on. I, you know, what's that saying? Sim, you know, simple doesn't always mean it's easy. So sometimes to fix something will take you an hour. Sometimes it will take you six weeks, two hours every single week. But just start. Take one and move on. If you can handle more than one at one time, more power to you. But the problem is that when we try and make it too big, we just don't do any of it. And that's not good, right? Now, there's another thing about having systems and processes is that our systems and processes are, you know, affected by people outside of our organization as well, aren't they? We can have all the great system in the world, but if somebody outside our organization is not, you know, towing the line, then that affects us. And I want to say that I had a good conversation with Jude Charles about that on episode 626. In that conversation, I described to him this multicolor pen system that I used for tracking changes on window treatment design projects with designers. And you'll hear, go listen to the episode. It still wasn't foolproof, right? Your systems will change as you go. You have to iterate them. That's for sure. And that's okay. But you got to start with something. So I would say, listen to that show for a whole discussion on how that challenging problem was addressed. And I also want to acknowledge the discipline that Kate exhibits, that she goes through and updates all the places that a single change on any part of a project is impacted. Like, think about that. Think about That takes commitment. I was a little like, whoa. (laughs) I, I mean... I can tell you that I strive for that. I ideally do that. I, you know, ideally want everybody in my world to do that. But it's not easy, right? But you could hear it. She's, you know, she's made of different stuff, I think. I wasn't in that line <laughs> when they were handing out brains. But I do have to learn how to work around yourself, if nothing else right? And her filing system is one of those ways. I really love that filing system. And the thing is too, is if you're a solo, maybe you're sitting here thinking, I don't need all this because it does, I don't touch. My processes don't really touch other people. I'm the only one. And I'm going to say, I'm sorry, that's not true. (laughs) I mean, really, even, you know what? I know it's not true. And I know you know, it's not true because I have had you come up to me even when you are the only person in your business and tell me how you've woken up at three o'clock in the morning thinking, did I make a note about X, Y, Z? And this is the cure for that. All right. So big, small, wherever you are, I highly encourage you to get on the, you know, evangelist train for process and systems. Okay. Now, Kate, thanks so much for this. I really appreciate it. And I encourage you, if this hits you between the eyes, to visit her website at thedesignerscollab.com. Of course, the link will be in the show notes. And um, see if maybe she can help you. Speaking of show notes, do you know that I have show notes? Do you know what they are? Do you know that when you watch, you know, you have your podcast episode in your phone, you can click on the icon and it brings you to the notes for the episode. And my team does a great job of pulling out um, significant parts of the conversation, like the aha moments or when a guest said something that's particularly um, poignant or inspiring or impactful. Um, And what happens is they timestamp it for you. So, um, and there's other, there's the links and all the things are there. I thought it might've just been time to remind you of all the work that goes into that that's there to help make your life easier. So hopefully you'll find them interesting and useful. All right. Thank you tons for joining me today. I do appreciate it as always. And if you are going to be in High Point next week, please come and say hi to me. I would love to see you and give you a big hug. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.